Okay, welcome. This is Worm Composting. My name is Nancy Kreef. I'm a horticulture educator in Cook County. I'm based in Matteson, and I basically work mainly with the South Cook Master Gardener program. And so if you heard of Master Gardeners, they're out in the communities doing similar work to myself. They present topics like this. And, and right now with uh, COVID going on, we're in the midst of trying to get them trained to deliver Zoom programs. So hopefully you'll get to hear, hear from them as well as other educators such as myself. Uh, but a shout out to Jenna and Evergreen Park Library. I grew up in Mount Greenwood near Evergreen Park and just love that library if you've never been. Uh, it's, it has a wonderful display of a native garden and they do a lot with uh, milkweeds and monarch butterflies. So, so really neat uh, place to visit. So I hope you get a chance to get out there. I work for, with, with the extension service. So basically we're the outreach arm of University of Illinois. So we're out in the community doing community gardens, school gardens, presentations like this and similar presentations for, for school groups or anything that anyone that wants to hear from us really. So um, keep us in mind and I'll share my contact information at the end, but thank you all for joining. I'm so, so passionate about worm composting. I mean, I learned about this as an intern uh, working with Extension. I went to the agricultural high school right there in Mount Greenwood near Evergreen Park. So I was exposed to this as a teenager and it just stuck with me. And now that I'm an apartment dweller, uh, it's great because I don't have a yard to compost. So I do this uh, in the basement. I have space here, but if you had a small enough bin or space in a closet or under a sink, you could certainly do it uh, right in your kitchen where it's nice and handy. So the biggest uh, thing about worm composting is you could do it year round. So many people don't get out in their yard to, to compost in their backyard bins. Um, so certainly you could do worm composting indoors. It's, it's really made for an indoor setting. And you're doing your part for the environment. Like Jenna said, we, you know, you'll, you'll come up with a usable product for your plants, which is great, but you're also diverting a lot of waste from, from landfills, from being burned, which just pollutes the, the environment. So it's a great way to reduce your waste and make a useful product, we, which we call black gold. Okay, so uh, worm composting or vermi composting is, is how the, this is termed. Vermi means uh, worm. So it's, it's really the raising of worms under controlled conditions. Uh, vermi compost is a mixture of partially decomposed things along with the bedding, along with the worms and how they reproduce, which is by cocoons. Uh, there also will be other organisms that find your way, they find their way into your worm bin. Uh, it could be little um, beneficial mites, uh, fungi, bacteria that are living on the food products you put in there. And as I'll discuss, adding a handful of soil. So it's really the, the fungi and the bacteria that the worms are consuming. It's, it's these beneficial microorganisms doing the, the work of, of the decomposition process, let's say. And so worm castings are your finished product. So this is when you separate all the, the partially decomposed stuff and the worms from the finished worm manure or worm castings or worm compost. You could call it any one of those. And then that's what you would apply to your, your plants. So we are gonna use a type of uh, specific type of worm. That's the red wiggler. And so you add those to, to your container Again, it's typically done indoors. There, there are some systems you could use outdoors, uh, but certainly you wouldn't have uh, holes in the top because you don't want rainwater to get in there and it to actually flood and drown the worms. And then you're dealing with the temperature fluctuations outdoors where your bin might be just getting uh, too wet or uh, too dry uh, with, with the temperature. So it's, it's, it's definitely recommended to do indoors. The nice thing about it is you don't have to do any of the turning. You really don't have to do much but bury the food and feed them and you get a quick turnaround process. Process. So you're looking at three months on average to have your, your worm bin from start to finish with a nice finished compost. Uh, my biggest tip is do not overfeed. The, you know, this is a pretty small environment. Uh, I'll talk about how much worms could eat 
but the worst thing you could do is is overfeed them. And I think that's what most beginners find they have problems with. They, you know, they have so much food to to give to the worms or to reduce their waste that they try to overfeed them. And if it, there's buildup moisture or they're not getting, the worms aren't eating this food fast enough, then you're inviting pests like fruit flies. Uh, there, there starts to be some odors and you might have fung, fungus gnats or fruit flies, which are a big problem in, in this environment. So I'll talk about ways to avoid that. And so I love this image here because it's so neat. I'm gonna talk a bit about worm anatomy because they're such interesting creatures. But in the photo on the left, that's a watermelon rind, which they just love. And all those white little uh, thread-like looking things are actually baby worms. So you could see the worms multiply and, and have these baby worms that they, these will be hatched from a cocoon. And so it's really interesting to see. And if you have a magnifying glass or even a, a low power microscope and you put these under under the microscope, it's really neat to see because you could almost see through these thread-like worms when they're first born. You could see uh, their body parts, you could see soil moving through them. So really interesting to see what you could find in a worm. And, and we do this a lot with children, but of course uh, adults love it too, but we usually bring out our worm bins and, and students love digging in through there. And then I tell them they're digging through worm poop and, and they all go, ew. So it's, it's really cute and fun and just a great family activity. So uh, I mentioned using red worms, specifically red wigglers, that's Asinia fetida is the Latin name. And so that's what you wanna order when you're ordering online or you know perhaps you wanna go to a bait shop, but honestly, you'll get much more bang for your buck ordering worms in bulk. So the typical price might be 20 to $30 per pound you know, where you may only be getting a couple dozen for a dollar or so in the bait shop. And one pound equals about a thousand red wigglers. So, so that's something to keep in mind. There are vendors online and, and that's what I would recommend. They usually ship them pretty quick. Uh, you wouldn't use earthworms that you would dig up from your backyard because they really like the temperatures to be much cooler, around 50 degrees Fahrenheit and they're burrowers. So they like to go down into the soil. Whereas the red worms, they like it around room temperature and they also are surface feeders. So they're happy in a, a system like a worm bin. So as far as their body parts go, they have a, a beginning and an end. Some people might call it a head and a tail. Uh, that's not technically correct. So we would call it an anterior and a posterior. And the posterior is where all the magic happens. That's where their poop comes out and and they're providing that nice fresh worm manure. So pretty neat when you are able to look at these up close or even just run your fingers along a worm, you could feel the ripples of their uh, segments. And so they'll have 120 to 170 segments. And on each uh, segment, there's these little tiny uh, hair-like structures called CT or setae. And that's what really helps the worm move and, and, and crawl through something like soil. And if you ever look very closely, there's actually this little flap by the mouth. It's called the prostomium and it's kind of a food filter. So as they're crawling through the soil, really moving their way through the soil, um, they could open and close that to kind of regulate or control what they're intaking. And the clitellum, so this is their reproductive organ. And what's so fascinating about worms is that they're hermaphrodites, which means they have both female and male body organs. And so this doesn't mean that they could reproduce asexually or just reproduce on their own. They still need two worms to uh, reproduce. So they usually slide across each other and then they both could drop cocoons. And, and what happens is the, the baby worms will hatch from these cocoons. Something else very interesting about them is that they have five hearts. And technically they're not really hearts, they're, there's more like these uh, valves to pump blood. And a lot of times you might see they're kind of uh, symmetric. So, so uh, they almost connect on both sides and you might hear people say they have 10 hearts 
but it's a little bit more accurate to say that they have five hearts. So a lot of love to give. That's whenever I ask uh, youth about that. Why do you think they have five hearts? Well, because a lot of love to give. So that's always cute. But um, really, scientists are, aren't really sure why they have five hearts. If I had to take an educated guess, I would, I would guess it's their long body and they, they need some extra pumping action to move blood through their body. So how worms breathe. Um, it's really important to regulate and, and keep a, a nice moisture level in your worm bin because they breathe through their skin. So their skin has to remain moist all the time in order for them to breathe. So it's, it's staying wet all the time. Not that they could swim, you know, so they're not swimming in any puddles of water. Um, but something you might notice is when it, we have a heavy rain outdoors, you know, this is similar to even the earthworm, similar anatomy. So if it, there's a heavy rain outdoors and you see earthworms come up through the ground, it's just because all their cavities, their little areas to, to move around in the soil being filled with water and they can't breathe. So they come up for air and sometimes they don't make it back to the, to the soil. You might see them stuck on the sidewalk and, and if the sun comes out and dries up and they don't make it back, they almost just dry up, turn crispy and, and could die fairly quickly. This almost um, disintegrate in a way. So if you ever see a, a sad, lonely worm on uh, after rain, you could help it back into, into the garden or into the lawn. So I mentioned before, um, the bacteria and fungi will actually uh, find their way into your worm bin. And it's really the worms eating uh, the bacteria and fungi uh, that's a breakdown process. Um, they don't have a stomach, so uh, their food is ground up in a gizzard. And as I'll talk about when, I, when I'm talking about building the bin, that's why we add a handful of soil, not only for these microorganisms, but those soil particles help them ground, grind up uh, their food and, and help them pass it through their body. I mentioned this earlier, both female uh, male reproductive organs. Uh, so they mature very fast. So their clitellum is, and you could see it uh, quite clearly on, on something like an earthworm is really that band that goes around and the band is usually closer to their um, anterior or for uh, simpler terms, their head. Uh, so that's usually how you tell the direction of, of their head versus their behind the clitellum being closer. And that forms at four to six week, weeks old. So these worms are mature at four to six weeks old and they could start reproducing. Um, so I, me I mentioned earlier that they could, they basically slide across each other, exchange fluids and the cocoon actually forms on the outside of their body. Very interesting. And they both could release this cocoon and uh, there'll be two to, um, excuse me, one to five baby worms per cocoon. So when you're digging around in your worm bin, you could actually see cocoons. They're, they're kind of lemon, uh, lemon shape, mini lemon shape, maybe the size of a, a match head and um, very small. You might be able to find these even in your garden, but now you're gonna recognize what they are. And you could, it's really neat. If you look online, you'll find some live worm uh, videos of, the, of them being birthed out of this uh, cocoon. So them emerging out of their cocoon and you see these tiny little babies coming out. It's pretty neat. And it takes them about two to three weeks to hatch from that cocoon. So they are actually sensitive to light, uh, but they do not have eyes. Contrary to my little cartoon, my friend Herman the Worm, we use as our little mascot here. So they don't have eyes, but it's the cells uh, in, in the front of their body that are very sensitive to light. So that's why they like to hide in, in the ground. Or if you ever open up your worm bin and there's some worms towards the top, they kind of squeam and might do backflips just because they're, they're sensitive to that light. Okay, so now we'll get into choosing a worm bin and let's, how, let's figure out how to build these. So there certainly are commercial bins available. Those will run you uh, 30 to $35 for the ones on the top left. Now at the lower left, if you were to look at the worm hotels, can of worms, the worm condominium, kind of the more stackable 
worm bins, you know, those could be 50 to $100. And the upside to those is first you have to build them, right? Um, but what, what they, they claim to do is have uh, basically have the worms migrate up these layers and then you're left with the bottom layer of just the compost, the finished compost or worm castings. And, and I mean, that's a great thing because I'll tell you the hardest part about worm composting is separating the worms from the compost at the end of the process. And so I'll give you some tips later, but with these stackable bins, and, and I'm sure you could probably come up with a clever idea how to build your own stackable bins with totes that fit snugly into one another. Uh, but what happens is they have holes, uh, they'll have a hole on the lid, but then they'll also have holes on not the very bottom catchment system, but on the next layer, they'll have holes. And as long as your bedding and uh, food waste material is in touch with the next layer up, then the worms will actually migrate up through those holes. You add fresh food to the top layers and they find their way up to that fresh food and leave the compost underneath. And that kind of sifts through those grates. Uh, some of them will have that spout so I'll uh, use my little annotation here. And so right here, you see a little spout on this system. And so this is the system I'm, I'm referring to with that can of worms or the stackable bin. So that little spout, a lot of people want to call that the liquid that would come out of their compost tea, but it's really not compost tea. To make compost tea, you actually have to uh, uh, steep it. So you would, to make compost tea, just as a side note, you would take finished compost, put that in a cheesecloth and soak it into uh, water, aerate it, you know, keep oxygen flowing there for about 24 hours. Then you take that liquid and you could water your plants. So it's nice to uh, a way to apply something like uh, compost tea because you could spray it on a lawn, you could water your house plants with it and it's easy to apply. Now the liquid that actually leaches off the uh, worm bin would be called leachate. And so leachate, uh, whenever you wanna use that, I always do a little simple home test. What I do is put the leachate in a jar, I seal it and uh, I might leave it for a couple days, then I'll come back, open it, make sure there's no growth, no odor, because in that case, then there's gonna be some partially uh, undecomposed materials in there and that could be harmful to your plants or if you're putting it on edible plants, it could possibly contain pathogens um, that could be harmful to consume. So that's kind of my test for this leachate and even also finished compost. I like to jar it up and just do this, uh, you know, cutting off oxygen to see if any bad things start growing and if odors or growth, that's when um, you know it's it's not ready to use. So I would add it back to the compost bin and let it complete the decomposition process. Now these photos on the left, I'm um, excuse me, right, are going to be um, something you could do for an outdoor bin. So if you look uh, to the top right, this is uh, something that has holes on the bottom. It's made of wood and it has a, a lid that keeps rain out. And, and there you see it built on the bottom right. And so we, we've we used these outdoors. Um, they work okay, they tend to dry out. Um, but if you don't have a space indoors to do this, this is an option. Now in the winter, um, you would need some extra insulation. Worms could actually tolerate freezing. It's not like they're gonna be very active and actively decomposing things at you know 32 degrees Fahrenheit, um, but they will survive. So if you had an outdoor bin, I would suggest bringing it into a garage or putting it up against a building, preferably uh, south side of the building so you're getting the heat of the sun. The, the sun's orientated in the south where we are. Uh, maybe even putting some hay bales around there to insulate it. So you can see that it's, it's a, a whole added layer of more maintenance. So uh, that's why I always recommend doing this indoors. Okay, so when it comes to making your own, uh, the materials that need are a plastic bin, uh, razor blade and liquid nails, and window screening, or a drill. So there's kind of two options to 
make your lid with the breathable hose. So I'll present to both and, and tell you the pros and cons of each. And so if you're going to use uh, the screen and liquid nails, um, you can make larger holes. So you're just drilling six, uh, six to eight holes, about three quarter inch each. Um, you could scrape the areas around the holes with the razor blade to help that stick. And then you'll cut out your screen to size and secure it to uh, the lid. So you're gonna secure that with something like a uh, non-toxic glue. You lay the screen on top, press down, and you're gonna have to let this dry for 24 hours. An alternative to the, to the liquid nails, if you're wor wondering, you know, worried about anything releasing from, from the, the glue, um, you could use duct tape. Now, my preferred method would be just drilling the holes. You have to drill more and they're smaller, um, but I just like this system because, you know, I don't have to worry about adding the glue and any uh, toxins releasing from that. Uh, I don't have to buy that, that as an extra material and I don't have to get screen and cut that to size. So I simply drill about 40 holes uh, one eighth inch size in the lid. And I also put a couple on the side. It's not absolutely necessary, but sometimes I do have to stack my bins for travel purposes, or if you don't have the square footage space and you need to stack vertically, then I put the holes uh, on the side so they could also vent um, if they're stacked up. I remember one story when we were doing this at the we were doing an exhibit at the Field Museum and we had these bins on display and uh, every night they would put them away. Well, someone, the, one of the first nights they put them away and stacked them all in a closet and didn't have holes on the sides. And when my boss came <laughs> the next day to, to set up the exhibit, while well, there were worms just all over the, the closet. So they couldn't breathe. They were trying to escape and, and they squeezed their way through the lid or holes, you know, it's really hard for them to do that, but you know, they were fending for their life. So always make sure you have good air circulation ventilation there. Okay, so making the bedding, where the bedding is a uh, newspaper. And so uh, with newspaper, I get a lot of questions. Oh, what about the ink? Well, most of your newspapers are gonna be a soy-based ink. Now we wouldn't want to use any glossy newspaper or magazine ads. Color print is fine, but they cannot get through the uh, glossy waxy coating on those magazine. And some people try to use like bond paper, which would be like computer paper. And that has uh, like glue in it to, to hold it together. So it doesn't really break down as fast. If you finally, finally shred it, shredded it, it would probably, the worms would probably get through it um, over time but it's just not the best go-to for paper. So although uh, newspapers are far and few between these days, um, there's always people around that have it. So, so what I do is uh, I don't get the newspaper on a daily basis, um, but I know people that do. So that's where I, I source my newspaper and I just stockpile it for making my worm bedding. And you could shred it uh, with a paper shredder or you could shred it by hand. And so if you ever look, you can see in this photo, this person shredding it by hand. If you were ever to look at a newspaper, you will see that it actually has grains, teeth or ridges, and you just follow the, uh, the teeth and ridges to, to rip it in strips. If you don't follow that grain, it kind of rips a little bit chunky. And so you really want the, the pieces to be in strips like spaghetti, and that serves as a great bedding. They will also eat the newspaper too. So adding the bedding, um, you would want to fill, uh, I didn't mention this, but the size of the tote you want to use is a 10 gallon bin. Uh, so make sure it's not see-through, it's opaque. Again, the worms don't like the light, so they won't be happy in that environment. And so get an opaque tote, about 10 gallons will do it. I like, I look for the more pliable uh, plastic. So when you are drilling it, it doesn't crack because I've had had cheaper versions of plastic totes that when I go to drill them, the top cracks. Um, so with the 10 gallon bin, you're gonna add your shredded newspaper, usually about halfway up. I like to usually, a lot of them have lines about halfway up and I judge that, but otherwise you could just eyeball it. It's not you know definitive, it's not rocket science. So, so about halfway through, 
pack it down a little bit, and then you're gonna add water. And so you're gonna pre-moisten this bedding and you want it to be the consistency of a wrung out sponge. And so as I pour the water, sometimes there's puddles that build up at the base. I just kind of tilt the, the tote to one side and sop up the, the water with the newspaper. And you know, if you end up putting too much, you could just simply dump it out. Or if there's too little, just add a little bit as you go. Then very key important part, sometimes people miss this step and their worm bins don't end up turning out so right. So you wanna add a handful or two of soil. Again, I mentioned this um, before, microorganisms are gonna help with that decomposition process. And then also the soil is gonna help the worms digest that food. So always go back and it's not like a bag of soil, not top soil um, that you could purchase Go ahead in your backyard, or if you don't have a yard, you know, talk to neighbors, get a couple trowels or scoopfuls of soil and uh, bring it back to uh, the worms. And you, I would remove anything like uh, rocks or things like that you happen to dig up. Now, adding your worms. So they usually come in a, a box like this. Some places ship them in a breathable bag but it'll come to you in a, in a container with some worm bedding. So it usually might be like a, a peat based product or ground up coconut husk, what they call core. And that'll be kind of their bedding as they're shipped and uh, they'll ship to you. It'll be live organisms laid, laid, uh, labeled right on there. So preferably be home when it arrives or make sure to get this package on the same day. And then you'll open that up and put it in your prepped worm bin. You'll spread that throughout the, the tote and uh, mix it in. I mix it in a little bit with the newspaper. And as I mentioned, 20 to $30 for a pound and that'll get you a thousand worms. Now, honestly, these, as I mentioned, these worms multiply quickly at, at young age. So you could quickly multiply your worms. If you wanted to do two bins, you could easily split, split your pound into two and do 500 worms in each bin, and that's fine. They typically don't sell half pounds of worms. So, so you're looking at just purchasing a one pound and, and you could certainly split that amongst two bins. Now what to feed them. So it's uh, sometimes it's a, a lot of your just uh, fruits and vegetable peelings. Now I know that uh, here we have in the photograph, I wish they didn't put uh, uh, citrus rind. So that's a, a orange rind and they really do not like citrus. As fine as I chop it up, I have done test, test runs, you know, it takes them a long time to get through something like a lemon, orange or lime. And so, and it's just like, they just don't like to eat it. I think the acidity really messes with them. Also same goes for pineapple. So I would avoid the citrus fruits and pineapple, um, but anything else uh, as far as your, your fruit and vegetable waste is a go. Uh, monitor it, don't, don't ever feed them too much. Uh, technically the worms could eat their weight per day. So they could eat a pound of, of scraps per day, but remember that they always have that newspaper to eat. So what I do is feed them about a pound every other day. And I always wanna bury the food too. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, some more when it comes to uh, feeding time. But potato peelings, uh, the smaller the chunks, the better. So, I mean, I wouldn't throw a whole carrot in there and expect them to eat it. Uh, so it's all about surface area. They can, you know, if you cut it up, there's more surface area and that makes it uh, more available to fungi and bacteria to start breaking down. Worms could come in, come in there and start the breakdown process as well. Now, uh, watermelon rinds, they absolutely love, but those are very high water content. So if you, know, you find your bin getting just too wet after you feed them this high water content, fruits or vegetables, then you wanna make sure to, to, to regulate that. So what you could do is add, add more dry shredded newspaper. And things like, you know, I wouldn't put a whole apple, you know, if it's a rotten apple, I would cut that up in pieces again. And those are so high in sugar. So I try to vary their diet, honestly, like they'll get, 
you know, they go through uh, something like coffee grounds with the filters, no problems, tea bags, you know, I remove the staple, uh, the string they'll have, you know, take forever to kind of get rid of that. I remove any kind of stickers uh, that are might be on a banana peel or on your produce. So certainly remove the stickers. They'll never get through that. It's not going to harm them. Eventually you'll find it and, and could remove that. Uh, but again, the smaller, the better. And when it comes to cornmeal and oatmeals, yes, they can't, can eat that. That would be dry cornmeal or oatmeal. So let's say you just didn't eat your fruits and vegetables in the last few days and you have to give them something that would be an option. But honestly, I really stick to my fruit and vegetable pe peelings. And if you opt to do crushed eggshells, you really want to pulverize them. You know, I would recommend uh, rolling over them with a, a rolling pin before you put it in. Uh, they, they have a hard time getting through that. As I build up my fruit and vegetable scraps, what I do is house them in the freezer. So I have a little Tupperware you could put in a bag and I'll put those in the freezer. And then I just take little handfuls out and feed them every day or every other day to every few days. And that also helps to kill any uh, fruit fly larva that's on there. If you are using eggshells, I suggest rinsing them as well. So you don't want any contaminants like salmonella transferring into, into your worm bin. Uh, foods not to use. So again, uh, animal bones, any kind of meat, oily cheese, they, they don't do that. So if you have a leftover salad with dressing on it that you couldn't finish, that's a big no-no. Don't just put that in your warm bin because they just can't process that uh, oil. And so I mentioned the gloss, glossy colored paper, you know, limiting to no citrus, honestly. And remember that big tip of, of do not overfeed. So if they're not getting through this food, you know, it's just sitting there, that'll start inviting flies to come and find it. And so that's another important reason to definitely bury your food when you're, when you're feeding them. I actually will lift up the bedding and bury the food. So my, my one term I use, don't dump and run because if food is sitting on the top of your compost bin or even your pile, then it invites these pests in. So the other key thing is to kind of bury it in different sections so it's easy for them to find. So it'll be smaller pieces. I'll put it maybe in uh, four sections or maybe I'll feed one side of the bin this day and then the next time I feed, I'll put it on the other side of the bin, whichever system that works for you. And again, I mentioned that you're dealing with one pound of worms. Uh, they'll eat just about a half to one pound of food scraps each day because of that factor that they could always eat the newspaper. Okay, now to the tricky part. I'll present to you uh, harvesting the worm castings and I'll kind of, again, the pros and cons of each. So this uh, lighted pile method is pretty labor intensive. I do, if, I, if I'm doing a classroom program where we usually go out into schools and we'll have classrooms adopt the worm bin, and I'll, I'll start them off, we'll build it that day. And then I'll come back halfway through uh, the three month process to check on things, answer questions. Then after three months, we'll come back and help them harvest. And what we do is give them each a high beam uh, flashlight. And usually we're laying uh, like table, plastic tablecloth or something like that on the desk. And then they shine lights, a light on there and the worms do not like the light. So they kind of migrate down to the bottom of the pile. Uh, so it takes quite a bit of time. I mean, if you have a whole classroom to help you with this, then you're, you know, spread out your piles and it goes a little bit quicker. But if you're just doing this at home, it gets, it gets trickier and trickier. I do like that image on the right where it shows you a nice up close, clear photo of what these red wigglers look like. So they're really small, really small. And they don't, they don't get much bigger than that. So don't expect them to get the size of a, of an earthworm, no matter what you're feeding them. Okay, this, this method works pretty good. We call it the divide and sort method. And so uh, once you have these finished castings, so that's a great image of the finished castings. It's starting to look like compost, that black gold on the top. And so he's pushing it all to one side. He's cutting off feeding for about two weeks. 
And then he's going to add new bedding. So your moistened newspaper uh, and fresh food to the other side of the bin. And the worms will actually migrate to that section that has the fresh food and bedding. And so this could take some time, usually a, a couple weeks. And if you're not continually feeding them fresh food, they kind of dissipate and disperse again to the other side. Um, so you have to be on top of it when it comes to harvesting and separating uh, with this method. This is by far has been my favorite method. I've been experimenting with it and actually it was a master gardener that taught me this. So I call it the mesh bag mig migration. And so uh, what I do is save mesh bags, usually from citrus or onion, even potato bags. Uh, again, I'll cut off feeding for about two weeks, so getting them nice and hungry. And then what I'll do is add fresh uh, food to the uh, inside the mesh bag. And I usually like to give them food that they'll love, uh, like the watermelons, very inviting for them to come and uh, eat from that. I'll bury this mesh bag. I might do two or three at one time in the bin and the worms will migrate into this bag. Now you have to be sure to get back in there before the food is gone because if it's been a week and now the food is all gone, um, then the worms again dissipate, go look for other food elsewhere. So maybe after two or three days, I go back in there, I check this and a lot of the worms have migrated into that. Um, now this is a bit of a stinky process. So instead of the, the the food you're feeding them being all spread out, it's kind of congregated into one area and there are some odors. So when you pull out this bag, it's gonna smell a little bit, but I pull that out and I just put place it into a new bin with my prepped uh, soil and moistened newspaper. And what I do is just dump out all the remaining food into the new bin. The worms are kind of stuck within this mesh bag. I don't try to pick them all out. I just throw the, I empty the bag, put it in there, and then the worms kind of find their way out of that bag and go for the food. So I have to do this at the end of three months, I probably do this method. Oh, uh, probably going on two to three weeks. And I might have to feed them and that during that time, do this mesh bag method, oh, nine to 10 times. And the, you know, so you just have to repeat this to really separate the worms. So that's my first stage. And then I combined it with um, what I call the lighted layer method. So once I got the bulk of the worms out, I started my new bin with them. Then I'm left, you know, and I'm slowly scraping off layers of finished compost. And so then what I do, Normally you would never keep the lid off your worm bin. You wanna keep the darkness in there, hold in moisture, keep out pests. But what I do is, is bring this out. You know, it, it's great if it's the warmer months and I could harvest, cause then I'll put it on my balcony here and I'll leave the lid off. And what happens is they don't like the light. So they'll naturally kind of go down to the bottom and I could scrape off about, oh, a quarter inch layer of the castings until I'm left with the remaining little bits of worms at the bottom. And so it's kind of, I do this in combination with that mesh bag method. And that way I could recycle my worms. Uh, so instead of having to purchase more worms, I'm just, they're, they're re multiplying, I'm raising them and I could just keep this process ongoing. The other thing is why I like to separate them from the finished compost is for one, if you're putting this in your house plants, you really don't want worms crawling around in there. They might find their way out. You know, if they did, they'd probably just dry up on your floor. Not, not a big deal. But this is an exotic word, worm. This is a tropical worm. It's a surface feeder. And let's say you put this in your, your garden, in your backyard. You happen to live close to the forest preserves. And they, they happen to escape. I'm not saying this is known to happen. But the last thing I want to do is invite another invasive species into our landscapes, right? So, so I don't want to just dump this in my garden. And, and they make their way to a nice loose forest floor and could survive. I don't think it's very likely, but I don't wanna take that risk. And so that's why I really like to separate them as well um, to, to recycle them and then to avoid introducing a, a exotic species into um, our gardens. So when it comes time to use castings or worm compost, um, these are a source of nutrients. We really consider compost uh, more of a soil amendment. Um, so the nutrient count is gonna be pretty low, 
But on the end, you know, thinking of compost in general, this is probably the most potent, some of the most potent compost you could get next to like a composted cow manure. Uh, so it's a lot of food scraps. So when you're adding that banana peel, you're getting potassium. When you're adding those uh, banana uh, eggshells, you're getting calcium. So having a food waste product does enrich the, the um, compost, but it's still gonna be fairly low nutrients. Um, the good thing about it is, it is that it's really a soil amendment. So this organic matter is helping to coat your soil particles. So if you have a heavy clay soil, this organic matter will help coat those fine particles and allow for more air and pore space and water to see through. Where if you have a heavy sand soil, it will help bind those sand particles. So organic matter in general just works wonders for your soil. So um, add it, you know, even with your fallen leaves, you know, instead of bagging them up and putting them to the curbside, add them to your garden beds and then turn them in and allow them to break down and add organic matter. So that's really the key here with the compost is it's a, a nice soil amendment, adding some nutrients um, and helping plants grow. One thing I love to use with this is once I have a nice finished uh, clean compost from my worms, it's pretty fine compared to other composts. And I like to blend it with, um, like it says here, peat and perlite, and you can make your own potting mix. And I love mixing it in with seed starting mix. Uh, so if you start your own seeds indoors for your vegetable garden or your flowers, you can mix this in with the potting mix and it's, it's just wonderful. It's gonna add that little bit of nutrients you need. It's gonna add some organic matter and it's not going to overdo it when, you know, not overfeed these plants and get them growing too tall or leggy um, when they're in an indoor setting. So it's a great, great seed starting mix. So just to summarize here, um, kind of troubleshooting. So your worm big care. If the bedding's too dry, go ahead and add some water. Um, so you could do this with a spray bottle or just lightly add water. You know, if your if your bed if your bin happens to be like uh, by a radiator or the source of heat, and your your newspaper gets dry and crispy at the top, it's really hard to um, get that absorbing water again. So you might have to replace that dry crispy newspaper that happened a lot in uh, classroom settings where they just never regulated the, the temperature and it was so hot in there that we had dry crispy newspaper. So it's really hard to get that absorbing water again. So you might need to replace that. Uh, if it's not dry and crispy, just add the water. If it's too wet, simply add more shredded newspaper and absorb that, mix it in. If you're smelling anything, you know, that's not good. So check for rotten foods and remove. You know, things like onions I try to avoid in, in the worm bin just because they are smelly to begin with and it takes them, it would take them a while to get through that. So like, I would certainly avoid something like a, a onion, a lot of like cabbage leaves that will emit odor. So be careful with those. Mixing the bedding, you could find these little uh, youth plastic gardening tools work pretty well. You shouldn't have to mix it too much, but it's nice to have that to lift up the bedding and bury your food. You could also use a plastic fork. Um, ideally, you know, keep these at 68 to 72 degrees. If you like it cooler or warmer in your yard, don't worry about, I mean, it's, I'm sorry, in your home, don't worry about it. It's not gonna, you know, if it's at 65, it's not gonna be detrimental to them, but that's just their ideal temperatures. And then check to make sure their, their food, they're eating. You know, if you look in there and the food's gone, well then, you know, they liked it, they eat it and, um, you could start the process over again with feeding. Typically after about six weeks, halfway through the process, you're gonna to have to add more of that uh, wet shredded newspaper. And so with that, I'd like to uh, pause for questions. What we'll do is here's my uh, contact info. We're still working part-time remotely. So email is always the best. And before we begin, begin questions, I'm gonna hit the stop record button.